Welcome to Satsang, everyone, and especially welcome to all of our, our young students. That is fun. Where are you all from? Dehradun Academy. Hills Academy. Fantastic. So, Hindi mein baat karo ya English mein baat karo? English, okay. Everybody speaks English? Yes. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. So, we have questions that come in advance, which we usually begin with. But since we have a group of students, rather than that, I want to take a, a different path today. And rather than begin with questions that came in advance, I wanted to begin by seeing if any of our students have any questions, because kids should always get the opportunity to go first. So if you have any questions, see that's why you're sitting right in front. Kids first. We will start with your questions. Anyone? Should we start with the adults first? Hmm? <laughs> okay. Think about it. After listening to your own renunciation story, I kept wondering if one can reach such a decision in a brief moment or does it usually take a while to ponder? How can one be sure? What I have found in my life, whether it was a path of renunciation or whether it was so many other really life-turning, pivotal moments of life, is they actually have two components. They have the heart component, which is automatic. It's instant. The heart immediately knows. But because we are also rational people, even when our heart knows, even when the heart has been changed, nonetheless, we bring the mind in as well. If we could simply listen to the heart and simply move with the heart and simply move with our intuition all the time, it would be beautiful. I mean, that would be an ideal situation. If we could tap into that inner voice, that intuition, that heart so deeply that we could just listen to it and hear it and trust it and move with it all the time. But those of us who have been very educated, those of us who have been very cultured, particularly in the West, but not only in the West, it's true also in the very educated aspects, even in India and other countries, is we've been taught from the time we're the sage and even younger, that the mind is the most important, that the brain is the most important. Figure it out, think about it, be rational. We're taught how to make lists of pros and cons. We're taught that this is how we make decisions. And so what happens with that is that we learn to trust our mind, but we don't learn to trust our hearts. What we're told from the time we're this age is, oh, the heart is impulsive. That's just an emotional decision. You should use your brain, be rational, have common sense. And so when you have moments, like the question asked about me taking you know, renunciation, it wasn't, it wasn't a rational decision, it was an instinct. There was no table that I sat at with a pad that I put pros and cons of living a life of renunciation and celibacy on one hand and 
living a normal life on the other hand and, you know, counted up which there was more of. It wasn't like that. I was living a normal life. And then I came here and had such a powerful experience that it literally just erased my attachment to everything on the other side. However, even after that, even after my heart knew this is where I'm meant to be, nonetheless, the mind plays games. And nonetheless, the mind comes in with, are you sure? Are you sure this is the right decision? You're only 25. What about this? What about that? And this is where pondering isn't such a bad idea. You know, the question asked, is it this or is it that? Is it you know immediately or do you ponder? Well, it's both. For me at least it was. The heart knew immediately. The soul was back home immediately. But because of the world I come from, both the fact that it's Western, the fact that it was not Indian, not Hindu, and also because of the world in terms of the intellectual, educated world. It was very important to me that I could also convince my brain. It wasn't really the brain making a decision so much as the heart convincing my brain. In fact, I'll tell you a quick story about that. I had been back in America from India maybe, maybe six weeks or so. And in my mind, I had made this decision already, in my heart rather, to come back to India right at the end of that semester. I had a semester from January to March, and I had decided I'm coming back in March. But then everyone started telling me, this is the wrong decision, what are you doing, you're crazy. You can't make a decision like this now. First, finish your degree, get yourself settled. Then you want to take a year or two and do some social work or go on a spiritual quest, no problem. But at least get yourself settled first. If you leave now, it's always going to be a black mark on your record. I mean, I can't tell you how much people told me. And so it started to disturb my mind. And I was sitting with a woman who's a very, very dear mentor, a very close friend, much older than I am. And so someone I looked up to, still look up to a lot. And I said, I don't know. My heart says I'm supposed to be there. But now my mind is getting so confused by all these people. What, what should I do? And she looked at me and she said, the problem is, the problem is, that you're trying to convince yourself that there's any kind of a decision to be made. She said, when I look at you, I see a woman in India. That decision is made. You're driving yourself crazy, pretending that there is still a decision to be made. And so you're going here, you're going here, you're going here, you're going here, you're dancing back and forth, driving yourself absolutely insane, in this drama of making a decision when actually the decision has been made. And she said, to me, really the only decision that you need to make is whether you're going to spend the next six weeks, because that's what there was left of my semester, whether you're going to spend the next six weeks packing up your stuff, moving it into storage, and getting yourself set to move to India or whether you're going to spend the next six weeks driving yourself crazy, pretending you're making a decision that you've already made. She said, that's the only decision I see here. So for me, the heart was so already done that for someone who knew me that well, she could see it. But nonetheless, it was important for my brain to at least, at least be given a little bit of respect. You also think, what do you say? But without really giving it the power to scare me out of making the decision that I knew was right. 
And here's the last part about that. The mind can only think in separation. The mind can think about something. So we can look at a math problem, we can think about the math problem. We can look at someone, we can think about them. But the mind doesn't do connection. Only the heart does connection. And so for decisions that are our hearts, the mind can't do it. The mind is always going to only do these pros and cons lists and think about it. In any decision in the life that requires connection, love, life path, you need your heart. So listen to it. Okay, now, back to our students. Second chance. Anyone with any questions? Hmm? Yes? My question is about... I knew you'd get the courage up somewhere. Yes? <laughs> My question is about to, like, to tell us about to dis make a decision to come in India. Yes. And live out here. So, what about those things which you left back there? Mm -hmm. Which you left behind, which you we should not, like, I am my like you you have you have a mentor, so we also have. You told us that complete that work first which you left behind in the past. Very good point. Okay. So here's here's what he's asked. He said, So you've decided to come to India. But what about that you left behind? He said, We we've been taught by our mentors. First, complete the things that you've left behind, and then you can move forward. It's the same, same philosophy as first eat your vegetables and then you get dessert. <laughs> right? It's the same philosophy that says first you do kindergarten and first grade, then you can move on to second grade. First you learn how to add, then you can multiply. Right? This is, this is how life works, absolutely. For me, in living that life, something was left behind that I didn't even know was left behind, which was my heart and my soul. So I was living, I was living a life that had everything in the material world, that had all of the comfort, that had the money, that had the convenience, that had the luxury. But what I didn't have was a connection to my heart. What I didn't have was a connection to my soul. So that, in any case, was left behind. So either way, either way, you have to make decisions. You cannot be in two places simultaneously. Somewhere. It's like you go to a restaurant and you'd want to choose between eating the pizza or eating Chinese food. You can't eat both. I mean, maybe you can, you're a young growing boy. But, <laughs> but most of us can't. Most of us have to eat either pizza or Chinese. Everywhere in life where you make a decision, you're going to leave something. You leave your parents' home to go off to university. You leave this job for that job. <coughs> when you have to decide, yame science karo, yame humanities karo. Decide, what, what am I gonna do? What path am I gonna follow? CBSE, IBSE, mother. Everywhere you go and you make a decision, there's always something you're leaving behind. <coughs> This is life. And so what's important for us to always ask, and for me what's so important is, what is it I'm leaving in different places? And so by being here, what I was leaving was 
things that I owned, possessions. I was leaving an opportunity at a career, several types of careers. I was leaving an opportunity at living that life. I was leaving an opportunity at having that type of a family, leaving behind friends and family members, absolutely. But if I stayed there and left this, what I was leaving behind was myself. And let me give you a little bit of a lesson about life, if you'll permit me, just due to the extra years that I've lived than you. There is nothing, nothing you can buy, nothing you can own, no car you can drive, no house you can live in, no one you can be married to, nothing you can have, that if you don't have yourself, and I mean your capital S self, your real self, the divine self, the connection to who you are as a soul, and it doesn't matter what your religion is, but if you don't have that, Nothing, nothing will make you happy. The Dalai Lama said very beautifully, he said, you know, you could have the most beautiful penthouse, the very top floor of the buildings. You know, everybody wants the penthouse floor. Big, big buildings, top floor, most expensive penthouse. He said, you could have the top penthouse of the most beautiful, expensive, tallest building." But if you were depressed, all you would do in that penthouse is look for a window from which you could jump. <laughs> the penthouse is not gonna remove your depression. But we think like that. We think, oh my God, I'm so upset. If only, if only I had that house. If just, I could get that job, if just I could own this, then I'd, every, I'd have everything. Then I'd be so happy. But it never works like that. And I say this to you as someone who came from that. I've seen it. I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in the lives of so many people I know. And so for me, yes, I left things behind, absolutely. But if I had stayed back to finish those, they would have finished me. And there are times in life where you have to make a decision. And while we're taught never to be selfish, and that's a very, that's true, we should always be selfless as a virtue, that's true when we're looking at the self as a lowercase s self. So yes, I should, I should give up my lowercase s self in terms of my ego, my attachments, my desires, my agenda, my fears, in service of all. So someone who only thinks about what they're going to get, we say, oh, you're very selfish. Someone who always thinks about others, we say, oh, you're very selfish. And you should be, that's good, that's what we should be. But, that's the lowercase s self. With regard to our capital S self, the divine self, we should be very selfish. And things that pull us out of that, back into the lowercase, things that are going to pull you into who you are, is your career, who you are is what you look like, who you are is what area of town you live in, who you are is how beautiful the lady on your arm is, who you are is that which is going to pull you out of the capital S self into the lowercase s false identity self. That's not a path you want to go. 
Now, that being said, it's important to reiterate and emphasize again and again, having beautiful things is not a problem. Having a mansion, having a mansion in the right area of town, being the most successful, having the most beautiful person on your elbow if that's what you want, nothing wrong with that. As long as, in the pursuit of that, you haven't lost yourself. Because you can be spiritual anywhere. You can be a very, very spiritual CEO of a company. You can be a spiritual president. There's no rule that says, thou shalt give everything up and only then you can be spiritual. Right? Lord Krishna was king of Dwarka. Dwarka was a city made of gold. Ravan was king of Lanka, also a city made of gold. But so clearly the problem was not the gold. Here we have two situations. Our divine Lord Krishna, the demon Ravan, both kings of cities made of gold. So clearly, the gold, the wealth, didn't make divinity and didn't make demon. What made Dwarka heaven was the presence of Krishna amidst the prosperity. So this is what you focus your life on. Yes, be number one, absolutely. Yes, succeed, be top, do the best you can. Because what you've been given is divinity. Everybody may not be divinity in math or science. Some people might be divine in music or art or writing. You're not all going to be the same divine. The same way that the moon does one thing and the sun does something else and the river does something else and the mountains do something else and the trees do something else. But all of them are divine. But if the sun started saying, oh wait, I want to be the moon. Why aren't I the moon? Look, everybody writes these beautiful <coughs> poems about the moon and nobody writes poems about the sun. Forget it, I'm only going to come out at night also. Well, it wouldn't work. As Pooja Swamiji always says, if the jasmine wants to be a rose or the rose wants to be a jasmine, it doesn't work. They can't be each other. And then you lose what you are. So what's important is stay true to who you are. That's, that's the capital S self. And that's the best gift you can give the world. It's the most important gift you can give the world. And that's how God has created you. So for me, coming here, it felt like I always say, you know, imagine that you were walking, walking along a beach and you see very, very beautiful seashells. You know seashells on the beach? Has everybody seen seashells? You know what they are? Okay. So... Sometimes you pick them up because they're very pretty, right? Who's collected seashells? Raise your hand if you've collected seashells. Anybody? Okay. So imagine that you collect all these seashells and you can put them down. <laughs> so imagine that you, you walk along the beach and you collect all the beautiful seashells and rocks. And you hold them because they're beautiful. But then at the end of the beach... There's somebody there with buckets of diamonds. And they're pouring buckets of diamonds out. What are you going to do with your hands full of seashells? Huh? What are you going to do? Huh? Yeah, of course, you'll dump them all out. Anybody not going to dump out their seashells? <laughs> right? Why? Because we, we intuitively all understand that as beautiful as they were, the diamonds are infinitely more valuable. Infinitely more valuable. And that the seashells were nice only because they were compared to nothing. 
we had nothing in our hands, then we had seashells, great. But when compared to diamonds, well, the diamonds are of infinitely more value. And this is what happened to me. Yes, I had all of these things, like seashells in my hands. But then when I came here, it was like the world was offering me diamonds. And my choice was hold on to the seashells or let go of the seashells. And so I chose to let go of them. And what I have found is that the, the diamonds just keep coming and coming and coming and coming and I don't miss the seashells. Does that answer your question? Okay, good. Yes. I see that uh, you seem to be associated with India for quite some time, but you're speaking a lot of Hindi words in between. So I, I'm not going to ask you since how long you've been here, but at the same time. I've been here 22 years. Great, great. My question is what pulled the trigger? How did you get associated with this organization? What was the, um, may I say, the thing which happened to you, and that's how you thought you were able to get associated and leave everything behind, because I like what you said about making a decision. You made a decision. Well, first of all, before I get into the story, I just want to clarify. For me, there's been no experience of leaving things, actually. For me, it's been an experience of getting. Yes, there's choices. As I said, Dan, you can't have pizza and Chinese. So in some ways, by taking the Chinese, you're leaving behind the pizza. But koya zing is much they I've left behind the pizza. You think, oh, I ate Chinese food. And similarly, if you chose pizza, you don't think, oh, I left the Chinese. You think, oh, I had a great pizza. So for me, it was an experience of what I was being given. That which I left behind dropped off very automatically. There was no sense for me of, oh, I have to leave that to get this. It was much more just a sense of what I had been given. And in short, in really short, it, it wasn't me. I mean, I would love to claim credit for it. I would love to say that I, I had, the, had the awareness to come here. But I didn't. I took a semester off of school. I was in the middle of a PhD program and came traveling with a backpack. I loved to travel, and I had been in school continuously for many, many semesters without a break. And because in, in high school and in college, you get summers off. But in graduate school, you don't. You can go all year long. So I had gone continuously. And came traveling and stood on the banks of Ganga here and had such a powerful, transformative experience of awakening that there was no going back. I mean, I could have gone physically back, but there was no way to undo what had happened to me. And so even if my body went back, I had been changed so completely that there really was no way to go back. And it was the most incredibly beautiful experience. And it has just gotten more and more incredibly beautiful. But about, about a week later, I finally had Pooja Swamiji's darshan and met him. I hadn't met him yet. So I didn't know anything about the ashram. I didn't know about all of the projects and programs and wonderful seva that he was doing. So for the first week, while I was in great bliss, I also was wondering, like my brain was still asking, he why and where and how, and am I supposed to just sit on the banks of Ganga and cry ecstatic tears forever, or you know, and, and what does it mean? And when I finally met Pooja Swamiji and had his darshan, I realized, oh, okay, it's here and it's under him that I'm actually meant to be living. So that was, that was how it all happened. And it's been just such an 
incredible experience of grace. Yes, absolutely. So, time for one more question from our students. If any of you have any. Yes. They say that God has, has written our whole lives already, right? They say that God has written our life. Written our life, okay? Then why should we work hard? Why should we pay? <laughs> Great. What is your name? Karim. Karim. Great. Okay. So he has asked a wonderful question. If God has written our whole life already, so what's the point of working hard? Why do anything? That which makes up our life has a lot of components to it. Okay? One of those components is karma. Right? Now, karma is, there's several types of karma. I won't go into all of the details, but basically karma is you do an action and you have a reward. So, I feel thirsty. I drink water. I'm no longer thirsty. Very, very simple. I have a glass of water. I pour some on my leg. Now my leg is wet. For those of you who can't see, he'll verify that I did in fact pour water on my leg. <laughs> she did, yeah, I did. Okay. So my leg is wet. The action, the karma, was the pouring of the water. The fruit of that karma is that my leg is now wet. And my clothes are wet. Okay, not too badly, don't worry, but nonetheless, they are wet. So. Very, very simple. Now, did God write that my sorry was going to become wet? This is the result of my actions. If I plant, I go out and I buy an apple seed, and I plant an apple seed in the yard, and I water the apple seed, and I take good care of it, what am I going to get? Apples. But where will the, how will the apples come to me? Sweet. Yeah, they'll be very sweet. Am I going to get a tree? Yes. Yes, okay. So my apple seed is going to become an apple.